Thursday night class, which unfortunately is the last class for the month of August. It means August goes bye-bye and now into September. Yuck. But in any case, uh, uh, we'll uh, continue on in our studies. But uh, remember that uh, being uh, the last class in August also means that our next service, which is Sunday morning, will be the first one in the month of September. And we will have communion uh, this weekend. So on se se Sunday, September 2nd, hope you can join us for our communion supper as part of our Sunday morning service. Uh, no other announcements to make at this time. No updates on Sandy. I think she's still doing well. And uh, unless anybody else has any other announcements to share or prayer requests. Cheryl's traveling this week, so uh, we'll keep that in prayer. Yep, so she'll be gone. Yep. Oh, she is? Wow. Okay. All right, good. Keep that in prayer. All right, good. All right. Okay, so let's begin. We'll start as we normally do then with a moment of silent prayer, giving us the opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9, the rebound technique to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, because it's a cleansed vessel that the Spirit works with, and we are cleansed from all unrighteousness through the confession of our sins. And that's experiential, not for salvation, but for our experiential sanctification, our daily walk with God. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <clears throat> And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in praise and worship to glorify you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us and our families and also for our church, providing for all of our needs in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm, providing your word and your spirit and your Son and your great plan for our life. Father, we can't thank you enough for entering us into the spiritual life and giving us a spiritual destiny that we walk in each and every day. We ask that you continue to lead us in that destiny, providing for our every need according to your will. We ask for your prayers upon our family and our church for health, financial, physical, and spiritual needs. We ask that you be with all of us and provide and care according to your will and according to your word. We ask that our church continue to grow and expand to preach the gospel of your son Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and the truth of your word to those who desire to hear it. And Father, we pray for our nation. We ask that you watch over it, protect and guide it, leading our president and all his decision-making authority guiding he and his family in their daily lives. All of those in civilian government as well that you have put in office, Father, we pray for them and ask that you lead them in their decision-making authority to honor your word and your divine establishment principles. We pray for our military, our police and firemen who stand on guard on our behalf for our protection, our freedoms, and ensuring our privacy as well. We ask that you be with all of those who are serving locally and nationally and allow them to carry out their duties and keep them safe in all that they do. We thank you, Father, for their service and for their sacrifice. We pray also for Sandy. We ask that you continue to allow her to heal from her uh, procedure from last week and that she continues to heal and recover according to your will, giving her strength and power by your word and by your spirit. We pray for my Aunt Jennifer, who is moving up to our area. We ask that you bless her and all her travels and allow your word to continue to be strong in her life as she goes forward in your plan. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together. We ask that you lead us now in song and in praise. In Christ's precious name, amen. And Cheryl, if you could come forward, please. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In your church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my song, Lord, be glorified be glorified for all time, Lord. Be glorified, be glorified. 
today. Thank you, and please be seated. <clears throat> Did I forget to pray for Cheryl? I think I might have. But pray for Cheryl and her travels. Okay. <laughs> All right. Her, from her mom and her uh, niece Sophie and her physical ailments and issues and uh, keep her travels in prayer. All right, so let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter uh, 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to um, be noting a couple of verses in the book of Acts too, but uh, many other verses that I have for you this evening. But we continue to understand the encouragement that God gives to us through the writings of Paul at the end of the book of Ephesians in verses 21 through 24. We are in verse 23 that talks about having faith within our lives. So the blessing of faith uh, of life is what God desires for us, that what Paul desired uh, for his early church and also for us as we continue that church and continue that walk, we have the opportunity for great blessings of having a faith rest life, a faithful life, and we are going to note that uh, in regard to what the book of Ephesians says in, uh, uh, in regard to the faithful life. Let me just say it that way. But I'm not going to get to Ephesians tonight because I have so much other information I want to give to you that we'll get to Ephesians on Sunday morning, okay? But this is all introductory. Uh, some of this may be uh, 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 a little bit repetitive for you, but trying to give the definition of what the faith life is all about, what it means, how it is applied within our lives. I'm going to tell you in just a minute about the noun, the verb, and the adjective, and the utilization that they have, uh, not only in the book of Ephesians, but throughout the New Testament, and the meaning and ap application of those, so that we can understand better how to live the faithful life how to have faith of our own, and how to express that faith on a consistent basis. And as you know, to summarize uh, what faith is, remember it's not just faith for salvation, but it's faith for every day and your daily life. We have to walk in faith just as we had faith for our salvation, we need to have faith for our spiritual walk. And then also, as we go on and look forward to the eternal state, we have faith of what God has waiting for us in eternity. So just like in salvation, we had past, present, and future salvation, and we see the word salvation being used in those three contexts in different scriptures of the New Testament, Faith is very similar to that. Sometimes it's for salvation. Other times it's for our daily walk. Other times it's looking forward to the future. And then sometimes it simply means the Word of God. Bible doctrine, what we do believe in. So that is what we have in this word faith that we're going to note this evening and get the introduction so that when we come back on Sunday and we talk about the application in the book of Ephesians, we'll have a greater understanding of what the faith life is all about. So it is the word pistis. We've talked about that already. It does mean faith. It means trust or trustworthiness. It means reliability, confidence, assurance, conviction. It can be, uh, also mean belief, what is believed, uh, and, uh, or what you believe in. And in that case, it sometimes is used for the Word of God, which is called doctrine or Bible doctrine uh, from time to time. So faith encompasses all of these things. In fact, this Greek word pistis is utilized in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was originally written in Hebrew, the Greek translation is what we call the Septuagint version. But this Greek word is used for about five different Hebrew words to define faith. So you see the breadth of what this word faith that we have in the Greek, and then now coming down to us in the English, the breadth that it has and what it encompasses. That five different Hebrew words were utilized, uh, or one Greek word was utilized to define five different Hebrew words and all the nuances involved there. So again, faith, having faith, trusting in God, relying upon God. Sometimes it can be used for the one that you are trusting in, the one that is reliable. Certainly the Word of God is absolutely reliable. You can trust in it. You can rely upon it in all situations. God is trustworthy. He is reliable. You can have faith in Him on a consistent basis. Faith also carries that concept of confidence, much like the Greek word elpis that we translate as hope. 
that really means confident expectation. Faith does have that understanding of being confident in something or someone. And therefore, we should be confident in God, in Jesus Christ, in their work and in their plan. We should be confident in what the Word of God has to say, that it is the truth. It is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword that helps us to define what the spiritual life is all about. And it also is that, like salvation, that gives us assurance, that we can be assured of what is, what is now, what has been, what is, and what is to come. Just as the Word of God says, Jesus Christ is the same today as He was yesterday, as He will be tomorrow. Jesus Christ is the same. We can have assurance in Him. Faith also means conviction, <clears throat> that you are convicted of something. And do you feel that in your daily walk, that you are convicted in the Word of God? You're convicted in the truth. You're convicted in the doctrine that you have. You're convicted in that God does exist and that there's a plan that He has for you. Are you convicted that Jesus Christ died on the cross and through Him you have eternal life? We should be walking in that conviction every day, that confident assurance that gives us boldness to go forward in life. Certainly belief, what is believed, the Word of God, we've talked about that as well. Then we also have the, uh, the verb pistuo. Now, just to give you a little preview of Sunday, the word pistos, the noun, is used eight times in the book of Ephesians. Pistuo is used two times, as is the adjective that I'm going to give you pistos in just a minute. That is also used two times in the book of Ephesians. And we'll note that Sunday, maybe getting into Tuesday, because we have communion that I have to get in on Sunday as well. But in any case, pistuo is the verb. And what is the verb? The actionable item. The action, the expression of our faith is what pistuo is. That we believe in something. That's an expression that you have. You believe in Christ. You believe in His Word. You believe in another object. You believe in God. Have faith in is what this word pistuo can mean. To be convinced, again, like assurance and confidence and conviction. This is you are convinced. You are absolutely, you know, dogmatically convinced and assured. And you know that this is right. And it is a fact. And it is truth. You know that it does exist. Again, being convinced. That's another expression of pistuo. Trusting in someone. Again, you know, uh, 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 in the business world, they... Uh, you know, I remember when I used to be in uh, some management training classes, you know, and you've probably seen it in uh, some of these um, tree, we like to call them tree hugger seminars, okay, where it's kumbaya and everybody can get together, okay. Well, there's a little new, there's a little, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a little object lesson to learn how to trust in another person. And that object lesson is, I'm sure you've seen it before, well, you know, you stand, you know, uh, you know, so one person puts their back to another and they're facing you, and then the person in front is supposed to just lean back and trust that the person behind them is going to catch them. And in that management training, the person behind them catches them, and it's supposed to build trust in one another and team building and all that good stuff that goes along with it. Well, if you have enough confidence that the person behind you is going to catch you, when you let your weight go and fall back, and if they weren't there, you'd fall flat on your back and probably crack your head open, or whatever the case may be, you have a trust in somebody that they're going to what? Catch you. They're not going to let you fall. They're not going to let you down. And you build that confidence, you build that trust, or they build you know, your confidence in them. They build your trust in them by being there to catch you when you're going to fall. Well, that's a great example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when we place our faith in Him. He will be there to catch us when we are falling. He will be there to provide for our every need when we trust in Him. When we don't trust in Him, it's like we're saying, Jesus, I'm going to fall down, but I don't want you to be there when I, you know, to catch me. Just let me fall. You see, that's not having faith. That's not trusting in Him. When we fear, worry, ha and have anxiety in our life, or we try to do things on our own, and we don't include God, or we don't rely upon God in the situation, we're basically saying, Jesus, I'm going to fall back now, but I don't want you to catch me. I don't want you anywhere near me. I'm just going to fall down. But when we do have faith, we're saying, 
God, I'm falling. I need you to catch me. And I know you're going to catch me. I trust that you're going to catch me. And I have all the confidence in the world that you are going to be there for me because you will never leave me nor forsake me. I trust in you. I rely upon you. That's another expression of pistuo, the actionable verb, having confidence in. I am confident that Jesus and God and his word are there for me each and every day, all through the power and the filling and the ministry of God the Holy Spirit within my life. Faith is that type of application within your life. It starts with the mental attitude of having faith and the mentality of your soul, having doctrine, what is believed, doctrine in your soul, but then it leads to an action that is showed visibly by you putting your faith or trust in someone else. Putting your faith and trust in God, in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, in the Word of God. And you then rely on upon them. You don't try to fight your own way. You rely upon God. God, fight my battle for me. Help me in this situation. Help me in that situation. I can't overcome this. I can't overcome that. I need you to do that for me. Go out and do it. And I know that you will. Confidence, trust, faith, relying, all of that is the expression of the word faith, pistuo, within the scriptures. And when we get to Ephesians, uh, we'll see that. And I'm going to show you other verses tonight in other scriptures that give us this understanding. This signifies the absolute confidence and trust and also complete surrender. You see, that's another aspect of faith that we are failing in in the church today. We don't have an absolute surrender of our entire lives over to God. We just have faith when it's convenient or when I'm in hot water. And I absolutely have tried all the resources that I can muster up myself, and I've seen how all of that fails. Now I'm going to trust in God. But fortunately for you, God will be there for when you get there. But unfortunately for us, we've wasted all that other time and gone through all kinds of grief and turmoil and difficulty because we've tried it on our own and haven't completely surrendered our lives over to God. And that's where we're failing as a church today. And I'm not just talking about our local assembly, but all churches today. A complete surrender unto God. And there's all kinds of gimmicks and games and all kinds of things as to what the Christian way of life is or what you know spirituality of the church is. There's all kinds of things and stuff that are man-made that has been brought into the church. So why? We don't have to trust in God. We have a system of cult of personality, and if they've got a great personality and they're a great speaker, people will flock to them. But the one down the street who's teaching the truth, who's just plainly laying it out, nobody shows up. So again, complete surrender to God is what we have to have in our lives. That the Word of God is important. The Word of God is key in my life. And without the Word of God, I can do nothing and should do nothing in life. It's a heartfelt obedience to God. And again, heartfelt from the mentality of your soul coming forward, trusting, relying, and obedient to God, Jesus Christ, and their Word. That's what pistuo, the actionable item of our faith, is all about. You see, the, the, the noun talks about the living faith. Again, it's a thing. It's what we live in. Now we have the verb, pistuo. It's the action of our faith, the expression of our faith towards God, towards the Word, towards Jesus Christ as we faithfully go out and live life, trusting and relying upon God and walking in His will and His Word with complete surrender. Not my will, but your will be good done as Jesus Christ quoted in the Garden of Eden. Then we have the adjective pistos, <clears throat> which again has the similar context to it. <coughs> Excuse me. But the adjective, as you know, is what? A descriptive, a, a descriptor. It's a description that is ascribed to another individual. And in Ephesians, we've seen this where in the first uh, part of the book, in chapter 1, Paul ascribes faithfulness to the church. At the end of the book, he ascribes faithfulness, the adjective pistos, to who? Tychicus, who was his fa the faithful servant in the Lord. So again, this is ascribed to somebody who is demonstrating faith, who has faith, and that is demonstrating that faith. 
They have the noun, the thing of faith in their life. They have the actionable verb, pastuo, of faith in their life. And other people have witnessed that, and they can ascribe that faith to that individual. There's a faithful person. As he said, to those who are faithful, to the churches of Asia Minor, as he wrote the book of Ephesians, as he wrapped it up to Tychicus, his faithful servant, who was that great ambassador, that great deacon, that great servant, and also a great pastor teacher. He was faithful in all that he did, in all the different realms of responsibility and service that God had for him in his life, to Paul and for the Lord Jesus Christ. He demonstrated his faithfulness. Therefore, Paul could commend the church and Paul could commend Tychicus as being a faithful individual. They weren't wavering. They weren't in. They weren't out. They were consistent. They always showed up. They showed up on time. They did what they were supposed to do. They attended the services. They attended to the people. They attended to the congregation. They attended to the Lord. They did it always. They didn't have to have their arm twisted to do it. They didn't have to be asked personally, can you do this, can you do that? They always were there, and they were faithful and trustworthy and reliable in carrying out what they were doing. They also became then credible individuals. That's somebody I can learn from. That's somebody I know can get the job done. That's somebody I know has the word that I can learn from. They were a trusted individual because they were a believing individual. So all of this is what this word pistos and the family of that word, or pistuo and uh, 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 what, what's it, the word? pistis. Okay, pistis. I said pistos, right? Pistis. What the noun pistis is all about, and that family of words. We understand from Scripture that God is absolutely always faithful towards us. We see that in Deuteronomy seven nine. I'm going to show you that along with First Corinthians chapter one verse nine compared with 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 and also 1 John chapter 1.9. Again, we just read 1 John 1.9 as we always do before all of our classes. God is what? Faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and righteous. Or we could even say faithful and just. But God is what? Faithful. In that every time we sin... And every time we go before him and say, Father, I've sinned before you, and we name those sins to him, the ones that we can remember, he is faithful to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us experientially. Now we're back on the path with God every time. Not just sometimes, not just when we, you know, as, as the church is, you know, as uh, a, a, a lot of the false doctrines in some denominations in the church have put it, oh, you've got to do works too to make up for your sins. No, it doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture. And that takes faithfulness of God right out of the equation, and he makes it all about you and me and what we can do to overcome our sins and pay for our sins. But God is faithful, and that's what we have to remember. And he's faithful towards you and I every day, every minute of every day. He is always faithful. He is never unfaithful to us. As Deuteronomy 7.9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness, his grace, his mercy, his love, to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And I love that, a thousand generations. You see, Israel as a people could have existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations and not be wiped out as a nation as they were, uh, you know, finalized back in about 70 A.D. until, again, they were brought together after World War II uh, in uh, 1948. But again, thousands of generations could have been walking with God if they remained faithful to him because he was always faithful to them. But because they rejected God, God had to step back and say, okay, you're on your own. You think you can do it yourself? Go ahead. See, he has to allow our volition and our free will. But even at that, God is faithful because God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to David. He made promises to them of a king and a kingdom and a throne to sit upon and a land and a people. He made promises that he would absolutely keep with them. 
We call those the unconditional covenant promises. And he's kept a remnant of a Jewish people and a Jewish race that will walk into the millennial reign, even after the horrific time of the tribulation. Even after the horrific time of the Spanish Inquisition, even after the horrific time of, you know, a Nazi Germany trying to kill off the Jews and the Russians killing off the Jews in World War II. After the horrific time of millions being killed, God has kept a remnant because he is faithful. After all that the persecutions, even before that in history that we've seen, God was faithful and he brought a Messiah through the Jewish race. And he still has a people that he will fulfill his covenant, his unconditional covenant promises to the people of Israel. And we get to enjoy that because we are in Christ in the church. But to a thousand generations. Again, how many generations are we faithful to in our life? Many times we can't get past one or two generations of faithfulness to our own people. To a thousand generations, he is a faithful God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. You were called into fellowship. And that calling was assured, and you were given salvation. And that salvation will be maintained by God in you for all of eternity. Because God is faithful. That's why it kills me when certain Christians, denominations, especially like the hyper-Calvinists and, uh, in, in, uh, in the Catholic Church as well, how they say that you can lose your salvation if you commit sin. Well, if our salvation can be lost because of us, then that means our salvation is gained because of us, and it takes the faithfulness of God right out of the equation. And it's all about us and our human works. And that's what Jesus was fighting against with the Pharisees as Paul was fighting against the Pharisees during his age. It was all about their works of keeping the law that would give them salvation. And they totally got it wrong. And we're going to see that uh, coming up uh, in uh, some scriptures and uh, maybe even on Sunday morning. But it's interesting that the word faith as you study it out and understand what it means, and you see how the meaning of faith got changed over the history of Israel. And rather than having a trust and reliance in God, the word faith, you know what it became during the time of Jesus and the time of Paul? Faith became a word that meant you kept the law. And as long as you kept the law, God would be pleased with you and you would have, you know, salvation as long as you kept the law. And you see, the object of faith got totally twisted around to us or the human rather than to God. And it became about keeping the law and what we call being legalistic today. And that's what faith became. That's why Jesus had to blow it up when he came and said, you don't know what you're talking about. That's why Paul had to blow it up when he came. You don't know what you're talking about. And they had to redefine for us what true faith was because it got so corrupted in the days of Jesus and Paul and before that leading up to their time. But faith is trust and reliance upon God that he does all. And in fact, this is going to blow your mind, even your faith, is from God. Even your faith is from God. It's a gift that God has given to you so that you could believe and you could be part of the family of God. Even your faith is from God. So again, God is faithful. Our salvation is assured through Him and He will be faithful to us forever and ever and ever because it's not dependent on us. Even our faith we can't take credit in. That's why we call it non-meritorious. Even our faith, our positive volition, even that is a gift that God has given to us to be able to believe. We also see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Do you believe that? Or do you believe Satan's got it over you? 
you believe Satan's going to win? Do you think Satan's going to defeat you? Do you get downtrodden and you know, beaten down and so oh, Satan this, Satan that, he's getting me here, getting me there? I remember my father told me a story one time. He was filling up gas and uh, next to him was a person from a, a church we used to attend and you know, the gas prices went up and, you know, and, and uh, the person next to him was like, oh, look at these gas prices are going so high. Satan's got to win. It's all because of Satan that the gas prices are so high. I'm just like, that's a strange mentality. You know? It's giving Satan too much credit. Yeah, we're in Satan's world. We understand that. But God is going to win. And if the price of gas is going to go up, guess what? God knows your needs. He's going to provide for you the gas money that you need so that you can continue to serve him. So again, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Again, Satan has nothing over God. We've talked about the armor of God. We see that God is really the armor that we ought to put on, found in his word, the mind, the thinking of Jesus Christ that we put on and we have strength. And that's why we also see that the word is faithful. We can ascribe the adjective of faithfulness to the word of God. Faithful is the word, or faithful is the saying, as it's quoted in Scripture. As we see a couple of verses in 1 Timothy 1, 15, 3, 1, 4, 9, 2 Timothy 2, 11, and also Titus 3, 8. Faithful is the word. Why is the word faithful? It's just a bunch of letters on a, on a piece of paper, right? A bunch of ink put down on paper. What's so faithful about it? Well, why is it faithful? Because it's the mind of Jesus Christ. It's the thinking of God. And as God is faithful, so is his word. And so those scriptures all ascribe faithfulness to the word of God. In turn, because of the faithfulness of God towards us, we should absolutely be faithful back to him in all of our work, in all of our service, in all of our worship. And it's sad. It's sad when you see Christians be, you know, laissez-faire. Did I say that right? Blasez-faire? No, laissez-faire. Laissez-faire. How do you say it? Laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, laissez-faire, blasez-faire, whatever you want to say. Laissez-faire, okay? Again, they're so comfortable with the world that they don't think they need God. And unfortunately, because God has been so faithful to them and blessed them, and especially in our country, putting them in a country that is so prosperous, that has been given to us by God. But life's too easy in the United States of America. We don't need God anymore. I got my economy. I got my stuff. I got my this, I got my that. I got everything I need. Why do I need God? But we have to realize, even in prosperity, certainly we realize it when we are in destitute. No, we're really turning to God because we now need stuff. Okay? But regardless of our status in this world, we should be faithful to God just for who and what He is because. He's faithful to us. He has given us salvation. He has given us an eternal inheritance. He has provided all that we need to get by every day. I mean, we're all here tonight, right? right? We got here tonight. We're alive today. We've had something to eat. We have a roof over our head. God has been faithful. We may not have all the things we want and desire and lust for, but God has given us what we need so that we can go forward. Especially as we are faithful to Him and serve Him and worship Him and show up for Him and glorify Him. So faith is not what we call a passive resignation to life like fate is. And that's the case, sirrah, sirrah. I've talked about that before. You know, whatever will be, will be. It's going to happen anyway, so why should I pray? Or why should I be faithful? Or why should I do this? Or why should I do that? Okay? And we don't chalk everything up to faith. Yes, God knows everything that's going to happen, but God also knows every decision you're going to make and has put a plan together based on your volition in that scenario. 
So we can't just look and sit back in life and say, well, it's going to happen. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. No. We have to have actionable faith. We have to trust in God, rely upon God, pray to God, ask God, do for God faithfully. So instead of this just, you know, passive resignation, it's having confidence that God will fulfill his promises. He will carry out his salvation plan for your life. And again, that's past salvation, which is already done, your present salvation, your daily walk, your future salvation. You're going to be brought home in eternal glory someday, either through the rapture or upon your death. Confidence that God is going to do those things and walking in that and making decisions and living a life of, you know, faith in action. You see, having faith and applying it to life, we are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we're going to see that on, on Sunday. We walk by faith and we are also victorious in faith. Again, you weren't saved by any works that you performed. You were saved by grace, through faith. Again, it wasn't even your faith that saved you. It was the grace of God that saved you. Faith was part of the equation that God put into the salvation plan. And we ought to live by faith, walk by faith. And we know that we will be victorious in life and certainly in the afterlife resurrection life because of our faith. We have to pick up the shield of faith as we've talked in Ephesians and I'll ultimately apply that to extinguish the flaming missiles of the evil one. When you extinguish them, you are victorious. Another aspect about the word faith in Scripture is though it's part of every believer's life, you know, there's not a believer that's exempt from being faithful, okay? We all have to be faithful. We all have to apply faith. The Bible says if you want faith, greater faith, pray for it. But the fact is that some people have the unique spiritual gift of faith. And sometimes we look at those people, especially those who have matured in their spiritual growth and have that gift, we can look at them as what? Faith giants. Wow, look how faithful that person is. They're, it's unbelievable. It blows my mind how faithful they are in all that they do and say and how they walk every day. That's because ha they have the gift of faith. And that gift of faith can be expressed in many different ways. Many times as a prayer warrior. And sometimes it's in, uh, you know, a, a faithful encouragement of other believers. Could be applied almost like the gift of exhortation. But there is a unique spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 13, 2 of faith that some people can have. But just because it's a spiritual gift does not mean that the rest of us are exempt from being faithful. We all, all believers are to be faithful. All believers are are to have faith. And all believers have the ability to have faith and be faithful. And I don't know how many times I've heard Christians and, you know, I'll say believers, okay, say that, oh, I just don't have the faith that somebody else has. And so they don't come to church. They don't do the things of God. They don't follow God. They believed on Jesus at least they say they do. But I even question that. Because as James said, faith without works, or, yeah, faith without works is dead. And therefore, if we have faith and we've believed in Jesus Christ, we're going to demonstrate that in our life. Somehow, some way, at least for a little while. And then maybe they go into reversion as a master of that, but at least for a little while. They have expressed faith and demonstrated that and have been participating in the church. But there are many people that, you know, chalk it up. Oh, I don't have the faith that they have. So they give themselves a pass from going to church and participating in church. 
And again, I doubt that many of those people even believed and had faith for salvation because God would work that in their life. So pertinent in every believer's life is faith. So we don't have an excuse, and no one should have an excuse. Oh, I don't have this much faith, or I don't have that much faith. The reason most people don't have faith is because they don't really learn the Word of God. That's why people don't have faith. If you want to have faith, which again, the Word of God is called faith itself, doctrine, okay? If you want to have faith, learn the Word of God. And I don't mean listen to the Word of God, okay? A lot of people listen to the Word of God. A lot of people, maybe in our church, are only listening. Or they go on the internet and they listen to this one and they listen to that one and they listen to this one. And they're just grabbing at straws. But faith is learning the Word of God. And what does that mean? Well, when your pastor teacher teaches you something, you store that in the memory banks. You think about it. You review it. You understand it. You read the scriptures that he gives you. So it gets in there. And then when time comes the next day, sometimes the next hour, to apply that, you do it. And you think about the Word of God before you think about anything else. But if you don't have the Word of God in your soul because you didn't learn it, you might listen a lot, but you never learned it, you learn it, then you'll do it, and you'll apply it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Jim just made that up, right? No, that's in the Bible, okay? <laughs> All right, so again, even though some people can have a gift of faith and demonstrate that in a fantastic way, really, don't compare yourself to another individual. Just walk your own life and say, how do I become more faithful? And as a believer, every day you should try to be more faithful because that's what your true relationship with God is all about. Faith implies that you have a relationship with a living God whose word has convinced you to respond on the basis of that relationship. Do you believe that you are in union with Jesus Christ? Do you believe that? Are you convinced that you are in Christ and Christ is in you? Do you believe that? Are you convinced of that? Then why would you want to bring Jesus to a sin party? Okay. Why would you want to bring him to a gutter called sin? You see, when we just think about that, are we really convinced in our relationship? If we are and Christ is in us, why are we bringing him into sin when we go into sin? It's a good question for all of us. Again, sin sometimes happens, and it happens quick, and you know, we don't realize, you know, next thing you know, we're in temptation, we fall into it. But again, we should quickly understand what we have done and confess it, and then get back in to fellowship with God. But many of us just walk right into sin and we bring God with us. Because we're not convinced of our relationship with Jesus Christ, as we should be. You are persuaded that God has revealed himself in his word. And you give every aspect of your life over to him. Is your family life based on God? Is your work life based on God? Is your social life based on God? Is your hobby based on God? Is your music band or class or jam session based on God? Again, every aspect of our life should be turned over to Him. And that's when we will truly realize what this relationship with the living God is all about. When everything is turned over to Him, brought to Him, led by Him. And remember, Jesus had dinner with sinners, okay? The taxpayers and the prostitutes. He had dinner with them, okay? 
But in that dinner, he didn't participate in their sin, did he? No. He gave them great lessons about God and the relationship that they could have with God too. So again, it's not who you're associating with, but how you're associating with people. Are you getting involved in their sin, in their life, and their worldliness, or are you bringing God to them? because of your faithfulness and conviction in who and what God is. And again, continuing in that conviction, even when we are confronted, as we are much in the world today, that this does not exist. Okay? God does not exist. It's all a myth. It's a big story. Jesus never came. Didn't really die on the cross. I mean, even back you know, during the writings of John, and sometimes you even see it in uh, Paul's writings. That even at that point, a couple of years after Christ, it was creeping in to the church that Jesus really didn't die on the cross. And it was all just a metaphor. Or that he wasn't God or that he wasn't truly a man. And it was just symbolic meta, meta, you know, metification. I'll say that. Okay. It was just a symbolic metaphor. Okay. And in our day and age, we're seeing more and more boldness by the world saying that it doesn't even exist. And as I've said to you many times, you know, I like watching, sometimes I like watching, I'm getting more and more tired of them now, the science shows when they talk about the planets and the universes and the stars and all of this because it's getting worse and worse and worse of no God involved in any aspect of creation whatsoever. And this they just shows to indoctrinate the people that God doesn't exist. And all the stuff we have just happened to be, you know, it's a natural occurrence of this and that and, you know, came together and this is what it is. But it's funny when you listen to them, they never really give you, like I'm giving you tonight, the absolute confidence assurance that this is the way it is. It's always this we think, or it could have, or this or that. So it's like this, this mix of, you know, this is what we're saying is how it got done, but there are little words are in there that say, we're not really sure either. But yet they're trying to convince you that they're right. And they're convinced that they're right, that there is no God, and these things just happened. But even at that, they can't state it as a dogmatic fact or reality. We can state as a dogmatic fact of reality, Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, paid for our sins. Through him we have eternal life. We can say dogmatically, I'm going to be in heaven one day, in eternal glory, seated at the right hand of God the Father. You can say that dogmatically and be convinced, because it is the truth. Faithfulness is continuing in that walk of confidence even when it's challenged and people doubt you and say oh you're all you're all wet you're you know you're, you're dumb or you don't know or you're uneducated or you don't haven't lived in the world or you don't know this or you don't know that or you live in a mic under a, a you know a, 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 or you live in a little petri dish or whatever they, i don't know whatever the analogies they say you know you live in a small town you don't know what the rest of the world is like it's a bigger world out there that's the real knowledge no, it's the Word of God. That's the real knowledge. We see in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. The ones that don't think God exists, they don't need God in their life. Sometimes even Christians who don't rely upon God consistently, his soul is not right within him. Especially the believer, because... Once you become a new creature in Christ, the only way to think is the godly way. And if you start to go back to the world's way of thinking, your soul is all tied up in knots. The soul's not right within him. It says, but the righteous will what? Live by faith. Do you live by faith every day? Again, New Testament quotes this. I'm going to show you Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and then Hebrews 10.38. It 
In Romans 1.17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, in it, the gospel of Jesus Christ. From faith to faith. Many different ways we could talk about that, but from God's faithfulness to send His Son and provide salvation to faith. You receive it. You having faith in what God has done. God was faithful to provide salvation. You have faith in what He did. From faith to faith. But it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And with that context, we understand from faith of the day of salvation to faith every day after your salvation. From faith to faith. All the way through the rest of your life as the righteous man shall live by salvation. We also see that the believer can become strong in faith. And I've given this to you before, but I wanted to remind you of these things. You see, you don't have to be weak in faith. Even when you don't have the spiritual gift, you aren't, don't have to be weak in faith. You can choose to be weak in faith. That's your choice. But the believer should be strong and can be strong in faith. Acts 16.5, Romans 4.20. The believer should be grounded and established in faith. Again, grounded and established. Our foundation should be faith. And how we function and operate should be by faith. It's kind of like a business. Uh, I have to go back to the brick and mortar days. Now with, you know, the internet, you know, we don't have brick and mortar, you know, buildings anymore. But, you know, a business first used to have to plant a building somewhere. And they had to put a foundation in it. They'd always have a cornerstone when they'd put that in. And they would build their company on the brick and mortar. All right? They established. It was grounded in the brick and mortar. And then established. Now the establishment is open. Now they could do business. Now they can function and operate going forward. That's the analogy of the believer in Colossians 1.23. Grounded and established in faith. Also, the believer should stand in faith. And we talked about that with the shield of faith in Ephesians 6.16, but also in 1 Corinthians 16.13. We are to stand fast in faith. Stand fast in the storm. Stand fast in, in, in the hurricane that is trying to knock you over. Stand fast, trusting and relying in God. We also note that the believer should be full of faith. Again, all believers, whether you have the spiritual gift or not, should be full of faith. As full as you possibly can, given your you know, a, a, a point of spiritual growth. Full of faith. You know, all that you do is trusting and relying upon God. You know, talking about that person at the gas station everything was by satan my wife and i had an experience this morning you know we bought a new iron and the iron didn't want to work this morning and so she went and got the travel iron out and used that and then put it on the counter and that thing you know all the water drained out of it i said well the iron demons must be at us today okay <laughs> the iron demons are at us okay but i said it jokingly you know i'm not thinking that the demons are ruling and controlling yeah they try to mess with us Okay. But the faithful person says, God overcomes. God is all-powerful. And God will provide. And the iron demon, go away. <laughs> Full of faith in all that we do. Understanding the angelic conflict. Understanding God overcoming the angelic conflict. And understanding Jesus has overcome the world. Number five, we ought to be on the road to a deeper faith. 2 Corinthians 10.15 and 2 Thessalonians 1.3. Again, don't stand on the laurels of your faith. Whatever faith you have today, don't say, I've got the faith I need, I'm good. No, go deeper. Go further. Go farther. Understand the width, the height, the length, and the depth. Understand it. Go further. Be on the road to a deeper faith. In other, in other words, a deeper reliance, a deeper trust, a deeper knowledge and understanding of Christ, a deeper relationship with Christ. 
And then number six is that unfortunately there exists the possibility of the weakening of faith in one's life. And that's Romans 14.1. That if we aren't diligent to continue to go forward learning and applying God's word faithfully, what's going to happen? We're going to lose our faith. We're going to fall back. And then when this happens or that happens, again, we're going to lose our faith in God. We're going to think that God has forgot about us, and then we're going to forget about God. So don't let that happen in, through carnality and reversionism and then ultimately apostasy. Don't let that happen. But Because it, it can happen, and it has happened to many believers. Scripture also tells us that anything done that is not based on faith is what? Sin in God's eyes. How many times do you confess that when you're using 1 John 1, 9? God, I wasn't faithful today. God, I, I didn't trust you in this situation. God, I didn't trust you in that situation. See, in Romans 14, 13, anything that is not done, well, I'll show you the passage. I'll give you time to write this down. But I'll, I'll read it in just a minute. But anything that we do that is not faith-based, it's not trusting in God, relying upon his word, or applying that word. And again, at your job, or at home, or at school, or wherever you are, yes, you have to think about you know, the job that you're doing and the things that you're doing. And I'm not saying it's always you know, Jesus, 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 you know, in your thought process every minute. But as you enter into these things, God, lead me to this. And then go do that. God, help me with that situation. And trust that he will as you perform your job or do your schoolwork or homework or whatever the case. And if we go out and just do for ourselves, it's a demonstration we're not trusting in God. It says, but he who doubts is condemned. And here we had, if he eats because his... Eating is not from faith. And you all know the background to this, the sacrificial uh, meat to the false pagan gods of the day. Some people were getting all uppity. Oh, you can't eat that meat. But, but Paul was saying, and God is saying, there are no other gods, so you can eat that meat all day long. It's good meat. Eat it. Nothing wrong with that. But then he said, if there are other people who think you're sinning, don't cause them to sin and just politely excuse yourself from eating. For their sake, not for yours, you know what's right. But if you condemn yourself, if you eat that meat and say, oh, I, I, I'm, I've sinned against God because I've eaten pagan meat. You've condemned yourself and you've now entered into sin. Okay. So he who doubts is condemned if he eats. But let's just say he who doubts in anything, because that's the context. If you doubt in anything and you're not trusting in God, whatever is not from faith is sin. Ever is not from faith is sin. So again, if you're going into something and you're, oh, I'm not sure if I should do this or not, but oh, I'm going to do it anyway, I'm just going to do it, but, you know, but you're not faithfully trusting and relying upon God, again, that thing has become sin. Not the thing that you did, but your, your lack of faith has become sin within your life. So again, that's another one to put on the list of confession if you happen to go in that direction. So therefore, if we have any doubts, worries, fears, etc., any anxiety, anything like that going on due to a lack of faith in our life, we are operating in sin. And until we confess that sin and then walk faithfully, guess what? We're going to always be in sin. And that may be the problem of many believers, is that you know, they, even, even if they show up to church, they may be walking in an unfaithful way, which means they're perpetually in carnality because they don't trust in God. And that's probably the problem in their life because they aren't trusting and relying in God. Yet what we should do is grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and have our faith that grows because God has called us. Our faith grows because of his word as we receive it. And I don't have time. I wish I had time. Well, maybe on Sunday we'll start here. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. 
but you can read on your own in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 16. I wanted to read these two passages to you because they're good understanding about entering into faith and maintaining faith. But we also see that those who are led by God, God opens up their heart and gives them even greater faith. And what does that mean? Not just what they think in their heads, but what they do as well. He opens up the heart of those who have positive volition. And that's what we should all endeavor to do. Let God open your heart up more and more and more to his word and to his will. And let him lead you more and more as you walk faithfully, even if you have to charge the gates of hell, as they like to say. Let God open up your heart to faith. And you will be a faithful individual, and you will have more faith within your life. All right, so didn't get to everything, but uh, we'll pick it up on Sunday. Let's close here. Now in prayer, Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us faith, for salvation, and faith to walk in your plan. And Father, we pray for each individual member here and ourselves that we have greater faith within our lives as we can understand your word and apply it more and more in our daily walk through your spirit and growing in our relationship with your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask that you increase our faith so that we go forward in your plan. We ask for your travel blessings on our way home this evening, and we ask that you continue to watch over our every need. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right.